And welcome everyone. It's great to see you for our final director's happy hour. We've been talking about how we can start doing these in person someday. Wouldn't that be fun to be together and look at artwork in the galleries and have a cocktail? So we're talking about it. Um, let me share my screen real quick. We can get started. You see my intro slide. Tonight we're talking about George Forrester and uh, the history of still life painting. And uh, I have prepared about three hours of uh, information, so get comfortable. I did uh, whittle it down to two hours, so uh, we'll take a break after 60 minutes. Um, <laughs> just kidding, but that's just to say there's a lot. You think about still life and it's like this really simple genre, but there's actually so much that we can talk about it. So tonight, um, I'm going to introduce you to this painting by George Forster. It's called Still Life with Fruit. Forster was German-American and lived from 1817 to 1896. And this painting dates from 1866. It's an oil on canvas. And we acquired it in 2018. And it was actually the first still life that was acquired for the Rockwell Collection. So pretty monumental. So tonight we're going to take a really quick uh, look at the history of still life painting because I just wanted to under, you to understand kind of the context of this painting uh, within the genre. And then I'm going to give you a little bit of intro to George Forster. And we're going to look at and analyze the subject of this painting, thinking about the history of uh, the late 19th century and some of the symbolism that's embedded in it because it, there's a lot to talk about here. But before we get into George Forster, I just wanted to make sure we all understood what we're talking about and give you a little bit more information on how we think about still life as far as what our, our history and our historians. So when we're looking at still life, um, we're talking about a painting or drawing and it's arrangement of objects. Um, very often it's fruit, flowers, and the artist a lot of times tries to pick objects that are contrasting so that they can show a lot of different textures and have a lot of variety in their painting. Um, also kind of a weird fact, uh, the plural of still life is actually still lives, not still lives, which is contrary to what we would think is proper grammar, but that's one of those weird art history uh, things. There's also a couple of subcategories of still life. So uh, one form of still life is called the memento mori. And this means in Latin, remember you die, which is really depressing, but it's something artists like to remind us of sometime. And, and for these still lifes, they contain, they contain an object that is a reference to our mortality. And very often it's something very literal, like a skull, uh, but it could also be a timepiece, like an hourglass or a clock. And sometimes it's even more subtle. It might be a wilting flower, or it could be a fly or another insect that's on an arrangement of food that just reminds us of the temporality of life. And there's actually even one more kind of like sub sub category, and that's called the vanitas. And a, a vanitas is a is really a form of memento mori that takes it one step further. So a vanitas um, includes those symbolisms like a skull that reminds us of, of our mortality, but then it also contains images or objects that also let us uh, remember the worthlessness of worldly goods and pleasure. So it's saying that you know what what is important is what's after this life, not what is a part of this life. So remember that you take advantage of those things. So those are kind of some of the, the details about how we think about and talk about still lifes in our history. The other way we sometimes think about still life is as a detail. So sometimes you might have a painting, I didn't bring an example in, but you might have a painting that has a still life as part of it. And we look at, sometimes we look at those separately and, and as a part of a larger scheme. So now we're going to go way back in history. So this is a painting from the tomb of Mena in Thebes. It's from the Egyptian New Kingdom, um, and it dates from 1550 to 1069 BCE. And this is one of the example of one of the earliest still life. So still life painting is a tradition that's very old, and, and artists have been employing it for a variety of reasons in a variety of ways for thousands of years. It's not just something that um, that people paint um, as a hobby and hang in their dining room. This is something that's been utilized in a variety of ways. And in this case, the still life contains fish and fowl, what appear to be baskets of fruit, wine, perhaps loaves of bread. And all of this was included along with real objects in the tombs of ancient Egypt's Egypt to provide virtual sustenance in the afterlife. So it was symbolic and magical and a part of their religious beliefs. 
Moving a little further ahead um, to Pompeii and to the first century um, in, in Rome, um, this is a still life from the villa of Julia Felix in Pompeii. And this villa is um, one of the well-known because it's um, a building that the owner, Julia Felix, used to expand her business. So there was a shortage of housing in Pompeii right before everything went south. And uh, Julia Felix took advantage of that. She started renting out some rooms and some apartments. And she also um, rented some spaces that were used as businesses um, and public baths. So she um, expanded her home to grow a business uh, during this time period. And there's frescoes throughout this villa, including this one, which shows um, it's a still life with eggs and thrushes. And it could have been either in a dining space or it might have been in a space advertising the wares and the goods that were being produced by that seller. And that's one of the ways that was used in the frescoes of ancient Rome uh, was both as decoration. So life could be decoration in a dining room or other space, or it could also be an advertisement for people walking by. Jumping a little bit further, so I told you this is going to be a quick head spinning journey of still life for the history of still life. This is Abraham Mignon. This is a flowers in a crystal vase standing on a stone pedestal with a dragonfly. So a very long title. It's from the collection of the Louvre. And this is from um, the, the Dutch, uh, the Renaissance, the Northern Renaissance. And this is a time period when still life has a, a major rebirth. It's a genre that kind of ebbs and flows throughout history. And this there's a reason and there's an alignment with this, uh, the Renaissance in the North and also with American still life that we'll talk about later. And that is the rise of the middle class. So in this time period um, in, uh, in in Holland and um, Amsterdam, there is an expansion of the bourgeoisie, the business people, the middle class. And because of that, there's an expansion of the art market. And we see um, a new uh, patron for the arts. Uh, before this, the patrons were the aristocracy, the princes, the kings, uh, the nobles, and also the church. But now you have this wealthy middle class that wants beautiful paintings to decorate their home. And this creates a whole new market for the artists of this time period. And of course, they focus on the things that, are, that those people are most passionate about. And one of those, as you all probably know, was flowers and tulips and bulbs, because there was, of course, a great craze and a business around bulbs during this time period. And this painting, you know, we're not going to spend a lot of time with it, but it's not that large of a painting. It's 34 by 26, but it's incredibly detailed. And the artist has given us a lot of information about the varieties and types of flowers that they've included. Now jumping across the pond um, to, the, to, to America, to the colonies in the United States, still life is not really a part of the arts in the colonial time period into the 18th century because of our, the roots and our basis in, in Puritan um, religion and belief system. And the Puritans just really didn't have space in their world for objects that were purely decorative. They saw portraiture and paintings of people as something that could be in their homes because, um, because they, uh, they represented um, identity, they represented connections, but other forms of art were seen as superfluous and, and, and really secondary. So it's not until the 19th century that we really see American artists began to work in the still life genre. And this is as um, artists uh, immigrate from Europe to uh, the United States. And likewise, as artists in the United States travel to Europe and they pick up some of these uh, traditions of genre painting, of still life painting, bring them back to the United States, but apply our own um, sensibility uh, in the Americas as far as the fruits and vegetables that are chosen, uh, as well as other subject matter uh, to this very long tradition. And this is a painting by Raphael Peel. It's part of the Crystal Bridges collection in Bentonville, Arkansas, and it's called corn and cantaloupe, but it also features potato and cucumber. So it's really uh, these two um, vegetables that are a part of the European, uh, come from European um, grow, growing and, and farming, and then two vegetables that come from the Americas, corn and potato. So sort of an interesting juxtaposition, but very simple, very um, not, um, not in any way celebratory of these items. It's sort of just a very straightforward depiction. Later in the 19th century, you have artists like 
Pito and Michael William Harnett, who were known for employing very high skill to deliver a Trump Loy painting that really shows um, a still life as, um, as realistic objects. And they had, they had incredible detail to show, incredible skill to show this detail. And this is a painting by Harnett called Mortality and Immortality that falls within that category of memento more that we discussed earlier, as far as a reminder of our own, uh, our own mortality. In this case, Harnett's also reminding us of the things that are lasting, um, uh, the, the, a book and the things that are written in a book, music and the things that outlast us, the things that we create as people that have more longevity than simply our, our lives. So kind of an interesting um, uh, message that he's embedded here. So then that brings us back to <clears throat> Um, George Forster and, and thinking about his work in the context of some of these other. Um, so Forster is, is an artist we really don't know that much about. Uh, we know that he was born in Bavaria, which was, is part of Germany now, and he immigrated to New York in 1865 with his wife and seven children. And we know that by 1870, he was exhibiting at the National Academy of Design and at the Boston Athenaeum, and he lived in Brooklyn. But there's really very little else that we know about him. Um, he did have two sons, Henry and George Jr., and both of them became artists. So they had this family legacy and history um, of, of, of being painters that was passed on. Um, as I noted, there was a real absence of still life painting in the 18th century of American art. So it's really, the again, in, in the United States, this rise of the middle class and this movement away from puritanical roots of American society in the mid 19th century that really promotes the growth of, of still life painting as a genre as part of the art market. Um, so again, you know, this is an American artist who, who studied and lived in Europe and brought that tradition with them. But likewise, we saw the opposite as well. Um, so they're really looking at uh, the tradition of European still life painting, but the subject matter are items that are, were produced um, on American soil and thinking about the, the, the symbolism and the importance of those um, objects. So how can we interpret this painting? You know, it's kind of easily, easily dismissed. When I think about still life, um, I think about you know that that painting that so many people used to have in their kitchen that was the loaf of bread and um, and and just a couple of objects on the table. I think of something you know that maybe my grandmother had in her house. Um, so it's something that sort of like seems very simple and and easily digested, but it's not. There's actually a lot more in this painting to look at and to think about and discuss. So what we're going to do is kind of uh, dive into it and take a closer look at some of the context and some of the objects that are represented in it. Well, before that, I just wanted to kind of give you another quick look. So here's a contrast between um, this, the earlier painting I showed you um, by Raphael Peel and our George Forrester painting, just to give it a sense of kind of the, the different, the vitality that's there, the exuberance that exists in these later 19th century still life that were much more opulent, much more celebratory that we didn't really see in the early 19th century. So we're going to dive here, dive right into the painting, and we're going to do a little visual inventory, and we're going to start with the items that surround or present the fruit. So the first thing I wanted to point out is the setting of the still life. It's a sideboard or a table, and it's a, a, an object or a piece of furniture that has a mixed material. So it's wood and also has a marble or stone top. And so Forster's gone to a lot of detail to show us the qualities of that stone and the wood, um, but the slickness of it, the coolness of it, and the reflections. We can see the orange. We're going to look a little more closely at that reflection later, but you can see the reflection of the orange peel in that table. Adjacent to, um, <clears throat> to the right of the painting is a very um, heavy velvet fabric that's draped across the, tape, the top of the table. So he didn't just show us like one texture. He didn't just give us the tabletop. He gave us this combination. And again, it's his way of showing his skills as an artist. He can paint this beautiful, elegant marble tabletop, but likewise, he can also illustrate the qualities of a, of a piece of velvet with a fringe and the border that has a really very fine detail. 
If we look to the left, we have a basket. And this is one of the items that's used to display the fruit. And it's a woven basket. And uh, Kirsty Buchanan, our curator of collections and exhibitions, I were looking at it. And we decided that um, we believe it's a metal basket because if we feel that if it were made from natural material, um, that it probably wouldn't function. It wouldn't, have, it wouldn't support the fruit in the way that it does. Uh, and it also has sort of metallic quality that you can see a little better whenever you're looking at the painting in person. But I think the structure of it kind of implies that it has a material that's much more solid than, uh, than what we would conventionally use in a woven material. Um, and it, so this is kind of, again, a luxury item that Forster has used, and used to, show, um, to, to show off the fruit and to contain the fruit. To the right of the basket is another item. This is a compote um, that elevates the, and contains the strawberries that he's included in the still life. And it's a glass compote. So again, we have this contrast of materials. He's shown us wood, marble, uh, velvet, metal, and now glass. And he's really paid a lot of attention, a lot of attention to the quality of this material. So he's shown us the transparency of it. We can see the strawberries through the compote. We can see the uh, reflective qualities of it. So there's parts of it that are more opaque, that are thicker. There's parts that are more transparent. And he showed us how light reflects on different aspects of it, whether it's engraved or blown. And this is probably an imported item. And all of these items were probably actually imported from Europe um, or broad and not actually produced in the United States, which again um, lends the idea that they are luxury goods, that they are on a table of a very wealthy person. The final object that's on um, <clears throat> the table that doesn't contain fruit, but an aspect of fruit is a glass and metal ewer that has red wine in it. And if you look closely, you can see a little bit of that wine through some of the leaves <laughs> of uh, the strawberries. Uh, and this again is this um, communication of wealth and expense and luxury because an item like this that combines two materials, both glass and metal, would require a craftsman that was very highly skilled to make that come together in an object that's elegant and usable and beautiful on the table. If we look a little closer, um, there's actually another symbol here. So on the top of the ewer, the metal portion uh, that has the handle and the spout is an image of Bacchus or Dionysus, the god of wine. So what more appropriate uh, image to have on your on your uh, ewer filled with red wine than Bacchus or Dionysus? Uh, and this was a very popular uh, subject matter in this time period, especially in the late 19th century. There was a great renewal, as there was at several points through history in ancient Greek and Roman mythology and bringing that symbolism into objects of the home and into decoration of the home. So then going back to the fruit, I just want to take you through real quickly and just point out all the different fruits that are here because it's kind of interesting and it's part of what uh, Forrester is trying to communicate to us. So here back to the marble ledge, we've got um, some plums on a stem and we believe in the basket behind them is another variety of plums. It's kind of hard to tell. They're a little, little in shadow, but it may be another, another plum or another form of stone fruit. Then here in the very front and center, we have an orange. And as I pointed out, there's this reflection of the orange. Um, there is this, uh, you can see the orange peel reflected in that tabletop. And there's also a great attention to detail. Uh, Forster has shown us the peel, the pith, the fruit, all of it. And this is a part of uh, what was considered to be very important in art and art history during this time period, to be as true to the object as you could, to show it as realistically as you could. This is before modernism when everyone tried to make everything look like something else. This is when artists were really invested in communicating the true qualities of people, objects, and, and the world around them. And we'll get back to the orange because it's a, it's kind of important to, to our story. Next to the orange um, are some cherries on a branch. <clears throat> and then behind the orange is an apple. And there's a few more apples that are also in the basket and combined in the basket. Uh, and we had Sam Van Aken. Some of you may be familiar with the work. We have the Tree of 40 Fruit that's in the park across from the museum by the artist Sam Van Aken. So he's an expert on um, historic varieties of stone fruit as well as upstate um, apples and, and, other, um, and other fruit as well. And he actually identified several of these varieties for us as being um, a, a part of a New York viticulture and, and historic varieties. And then to the right, right behind the apple is a pineapple on its side, um, uh, which is kind of peculiar. 
And we'll get back to the pineapple too. And then currents on a stem um, here at the, the very front. <clears throat> And then we noted the compote, and in the compote are, is a beautiful pile of small strawberries. Um, it's not those gigantic ones they have at Wegmans in the winter that look so beautiful and smell okay, and then you get them home and they taste like nothing. These are those little tiny strawberries that you go out and pick yourself or that you get from the farmer's market in the spring that have you know, beautiful flavor, beautiful smell, and beautiful texture. <clears throat> and then in the basket, um, we've got several different varieties of grape. We've got red grapes and green grapes, and he even snuck in a few purple grapes here um, at the bottom of the basket. So he's shown us quite a variety of grapes. Um, peaches, and then behind the peaches, a couple of pears. Um, so it's interesting as well as how, um, how Forster has thought about this composition. So uh, he has grouped all of the fruit kind of at the center of this canvas, um, almost like a very tight oval that's uh, floating right there on the top of the table. And then the greenery, if you note um, the grape leaves, the leaves that are on the, the branches of the, the fruit that are still on, uh, that are still, still have the leaves attached, all of that kind of is, uh, is around the fruit. It almost serves like a halo or like the rays of light around the sun. So again, it emphasizes the fruit, it brings it forward and it provides again, the sort of uh, this context for it in a space that really has no other context. We don't know what, what room this in. There's no other information about the background or what might be around this table or around this uh, pile of fruit. So it's all about kind of giving us the setting uh, for the fruit that he uh, uh, has selected. <clears throat> so it's interesting, um, a couple of things about these, uh, the selection of fruit. Uh, any observations from the crowd on, on um, what all of this fruit has in common or doesn't have in common? Brian, we have a comment. Uh, not all the fruits are in season at the same time. Exactly. This is that's the that's the big story here. So Forrester has given us fruit from all four seasons, from oranges, which we get in the winter, um, uh, the the fruits of spring, the stone fruits of summer, and apples and pears that we harvest in the fall. Uh, and so today, you know, if you want to go to Wegmans or to Kroger's or, or wherever and buy fruit, you can buy all, all probably every single piece of fruit that's on this table, with the exception of the currants. Currants are still pretty seasonal item, but everything else are something that you can buy. Will it taste good? Will, you know, will your cherries be delicious in January? Probably not, but, um, but you can still uh, select those. But in the late 19th century, that's not the case. Um, uh, food was very seasonal. It was hyper seasonal. And the only way to enjoy fruit out of season was really by preservation methods, which were few and far between. And they didn't, we didn't have the ability to do, to move fruit from one part of the country to another easily. Therefore, when you did do that, it was incredibly expensive. The other thing that's interesting about this um, is that all the fruit that's here is something that can be eaten out of hand as far as an apple or strawberries, with the exception of uh, the orange, which is being presented, um, it's prepared, it's open, and it's ready to eat, and the pineapple, which remains uncut. And these are kind of two um, uh, kind of uh, more symbolic uh, fruits that he's included here that we're gonna dive into just a little bit more. So back to the orange and its open peel uh, and its reflection on that table. So even when we're talking about a fantasy still life, which is what Forrester has given us here, not something that he would actually have been able to create in real life during this time period, there's still a hierarchy and there's still an emphasis on fruit that might be more rare or special, like the orange, something that's very exotic. And I think about the holidays when we might receive an orange in our stocking, which is a tradition that goes very old and goes back very far because oranges were prized and very special and uh, not something that everyone got every day, um, especially in this time period. Um, <clears throat> oranges have a lot of symbolism in our history. They symbolize uh, fertility, fecundity, uh, and, and showing the orange in this way, open and ready to eat, um, Forster's really underscoring the abundance of what was available in the American landscape. And he's also, um, again, 
emphasizing the luxury and the riches that this uh, tablescape symbolizes. He's done that with the objects that display and hold the fruit and then with the fruit itself. <clears throat> so moving on to the pineapple, which is even a little more exotic than the orange, um, thinking about you know, the pineapple and what it means, it has a lot of symbolism even today. Uh, you know, the pineapple is a symbol of hospitality. And in this time period, it was a symbol of luxury and wealth. Um, so it was very revered, revered. And to have a pineapple in the continental United States, it had to be imported from the Caribbean. And those were very costly and it was very expensive. I hope you're all sitting down because I'm going to tell you that one pineapple in the 1700s could cost as much as $8,000 in, in today's money. $8,000. I, at Weggies today, it was $4 for a pineapple. So they definitely become more affordable. But it's unbelievable. And this, this, this was all based on the craze that was created by this exotic fruit when it was first imported to Europe. And the King of Spain received the first pineapple to arrive in Europe. And he proclaimed that it was the most delicious fruit in the entire world. And that set off a craze in his court that just rippled across uh, the world. And people became obsessed with these pineapples. Um, so it was something that you cherished that you use to show your wealth, your success. And in most cases, it was a centerpiece. You put it on the table. It was there to be seen, not to be eaten. It was there to be admired, not to be consumed. It showed your guests um, that, you, that, it was, uh, that you were very wealthy, that you were successful, that you could have these pineapples on display because you were a hospitable person. And when you're, when you're sharing hus hospitality with people, you want to show your very best. You want to give them the very best that you have. Um, so that's what the pineapple communicated. It even created a whole secondary market. So if you couldn't afford an $8,000 pineapple, you could rent one for the evening and have it on your table so that everybody thought that you were um, so successful and so wealthy and so hospitable. Um, I was trying to think of a contemporary correlation to that of what we might rent today uh, to show our success or our status. And I really couldn't come up with anything, but I'm going to keep thinking on it. Um, of course, it is important to mention that during this time and this, this obsession with pineapples um, and just the global market that arose in the 19th century was fueled by colonialism and the enslavement of people. That's what was required to produce commodities like cotton, sugar, and pineapples at a rate that they could be shipped around the world and they could feed this, uh, this craze that people had. It even created a craze for decorative elements. So the pineapple was so prized and so revered and seen as such a, a symbol that it began um, to appear in decorative elements and still does. You know, William Sonoma, that's their, their logo and you can buy a million things there that have pineapples on them. Here are two examples. On the left is the Simmons Edward House in Charleston, South Carolina with two pineapples um, there at the entrance on either side of the entrance. And then on the right is one of the most famous um, kind of follies. This is a really grand use of a pineapple mo mo motif. This is Dunmore House in Scotland. And this is, um, as uh, many of the royal courts had orangeries where they uh, grew orange trees and where they produced oranges, this was a hot house that was specifically built to grow pineapples and other exotic uh, plants. Uh, and he, and to, to mark it so, they crafted this gigantic pineapple that sits atop it in, on this dome. So very uh, amazing. So there's a couple of other details. So we talked about kind of um, the, the foundation of the work, the objects that hold um, the, the fruit. We talked about the fruit itself and some of the symbolism and this idea that, um, that Forrester was trying to convey of this uh, luxury and abundance and just celebration. But there's also other details that he included because of the skills that he had. Here uh, below the orange and across the, 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 um, the canvas are drops of water or dew. And I think they, they have a special kind Kind of it's like a little detail that just is sort of like yes and yes and he's just kind of again um, kind of um, highlighting and emboldening uh, the message that he's sending and, and for in this case this fruit is so fresh it, it has just someone just went out into the um, into the orchards into the fields they retrieved this fruit they brought it and put it on the table even though that's not possible it's still this uh, he's trying to convey this idea that it's uh, it has just happened and it is just the most fresh and beautiful fruit available here it is again on the currents. 
The other thing that's interesting is the use of the, the fruit on the branches. So this again is a subtle way of underscoring the luxury of these subjects. So you've got the branches on the plums, on the cherries, and again on the currants. And it's interesting to me because if you are someone who is a gardener or if you grow fruit, then you know that you're cutting out your harvest of the future if you're taking the branches off. If you take this branch off, you're not gonna have those cherries next year. You're not gonna have those plums next year. So this is, this, this is conveying this idea, the dew, the branches and these other details say, we're not really, we're not concerned about next year's harvest. We have so much fruit, we have so much abundance and in perpetuity that we don't even have to have that consideration. We can go ahead and just rip these branches off the trees this year and enjoy this fruit as it is. Um, finally, there's another aspect of fruit that's present in this work, and that is the wine uh, that is in the ewer that we highlighted at the beginning. And one of the things that you know, we can remember about wine is that it's a means of preserving fruit. It's a way of extending the bounty of the harvest, of taking what you grow this year and making it last longer and, 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 and enabling everyone to enjoy it uh, later in the season. So the presence of wine, again, is the other part of that uh, idea of opulence and enjoyment feasting and celebration. We have this year's abundance that's all around. We're not concerned about next year's abundance and we're still enjoying last year's abundance. We have so much uh, fruit and uh, we have so much wealth that we are um, <clears throat> that we are able to enjoy in all of its forms um, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So I hope that um, the next time that you look at a still life when you're at the museum looking at the George Forest or, or elsewhere that, um, that you look a little closer because they're even though it's a simple and kind of direct genre there's a lot of detail and in Forster's case he's used every detail to illustrate his points of wealth and luxury and sumptuousness from the setting and the objects that are used to display the fruit, the choices of the fruit itself, the symbolism associated with them, and the fine details that underscore his aesthetic thesis. All these concepts are brought together in a composition that symbolizes the perpetual abundance of the American table in the 19th century. So any, any questions I can try to answer? Brian, do you have a favorite fruit in the painting? As far as how it's depicted or? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, hmm, let me go back. I have to think about that for a second. Um, I think, I mean, I really love the orange um, because of uh, just the way that it's sort of open and it almost has this, um, I don't know, like the quality of a person, like a hand, like the, the way that the peel is uh, displayed. It's almost like it's being offered to you. It has this sort of um, is personified almost. So I do, I do love the orange and also because there's so many different textures uh, around that that he's shown us, the, the inside, the outside, the fruit, the pith, all of it. So it's, it's kind of a tour de force. All right, well, I am going to turn it over to Brett real quick so that I can get a couple things. And we're gonna make a cocktail inspired by the $8,000 pineapple and also the wine uh, that is in uh, the year. So let me end this real quick. All right, hold on just one second and I will be right back. There we go. <laughs> Change camera angles. So I wanted to do something inspired by that incredibly expensive pineapple tonight. So I decided, and the wine, so we're doing a pineapple sangria. It's a little different, it's a little tropical, of course, because of the inclusion of the pineapple. So what's in the picture already is uh, two cups of diced pineapple and then two ounces of light rum and two ounces of dark rum and then two cups of white wine. And I chose a Spanish white that's kind of fruity, not too sweet because of the other sweet elements that are included uh, in the cocktail. <clears throat> so to that, we're adding two ounces of uh, simple syrup and then uh, two ounces of lime juice, which will help balance out the sweetness of the pineapple and the syrup. And then um, a cup of coconut water. So I think this is gonna be a very refreshing cocktail. I think it would go great 
with a Latin meal or a Caribbean meal, um, or just a great uh, cocktail on a hot summer day or a hot spring day like we have today. Just stir that up. And I forgot my garnish. You'll have to imagine the beautiful pineapple I cut out to put in, into it. Um, so I'm gonna take a couple of these pieces that are have been soaking in that liquor because you know it's sangria, so you want that. Then it has a little bit of sparkling water. Um, so you can add that to the pitcher if you're gonna serve it to everyone uh, in one sitting, but since I'm not planning on drinking this whole pitcher of sangria tonight, I'm just gonna add a little bit of the uh, sparkling water uh, to the top there. And I've never made this before, so this will be a taste test. Hopefully it's good. It's perfect, very light, super fruity, very refreshing. So I recommend it. So cheers. Thanks everyone for joining us.